Hey guys, today we're gonna unbox, build, set up, and do our first prints, both the factory prints and one of my own, on our new CRM4. So what is large format? Well, there's no real definition, but this thing's a beast. It's 450 by 450 by 470 millimeters high. The only other printer that comes to my memory anyway that I have a lot of experience with is the Anycubic Chiron from years ago, uh, except this is an entirely different beast from that. So it comes what I would call 90% assembled. Um, we just kind of have the gantry and the base plate, which is a typical you know install we've been through a hundred or so times on this channel. Um, this base plate here though has some key differences. You can probably already see the shine here. Instead of us using V wheels for the Y axis, it's using dual linear rails. Um, and so, you know, you've got tiny ball bearings that glide along these rails. Um, they can support a ton of weight. Not that that's a really bragging rights. <laughs> I think the manual said 30 kilograms or something of, of weight on there. Uh, I don't know why you're doing that, but please don't put 30 kilograms on your printer for any reason. Um, but regardless, they are essentially maintenance free. You might need to oil them, make sure there's no dusts on them or anything. Um, but they don't wear like V-wheels. Um, you know, you don't end up with any kind of slop. There is no adjusting of the wheels to make sure the tension's correct or anything like that. Uh, it's kind of set and forget. So that's nice. And we see that on a lot of printers nowadays where they're using linear rails. Um, you know, we just recently did the Trudon V2 and it had linear rails all over the place. It has a beefy Y-axis motor as well. Um, judging from their uh, literature, it says that they've tested it for 30 days of continuous printing. Uh, I don't know what happens on the 31st day, but I've never had any motor, even smaller ones, have any kind of an issue over a period of time. Um, but beefy one there anyway, because we do have a beefy bed. So being that it is 450 by 450, um, you know, it's gonna have some considerable weight compared to a smaller printer. So you're always battling, uh, or at least in the past, you would battle things like layer shifts if you had your accelerations or jerks too high. Um, you know, you have the kind of standard resonance and ringing issues with a large bed moving back and forth. So to kind of counter some of that, they've got two nine millimeter belts on here um, to hopefully, you know, keep that bed from kind of jiggling back and forth if you had one smaller belt. Uh, and they've used a bit of an interesting geared assembly here um, to, uh, to, to power them both off the one motor. Um, anyway, so that's just kind of like first glance. Uh, on the side here, on the left-hand side from the front, you have the power inlet and the power switch. Um, there's one tiny little cable at the front corner here, and I assume that's where the screen's gonna go. And then on this side, we have USB, we have ethernet for hardwired internet. There's also Wi-Fi. So on the, you know, from your perspective, on the right-hand side of the printer, we have a ethernet port and a USB-A port for like a USB stick type of device. We have another USB-A on the front and a USB-C on the front as well. Um, and that's kind of it for ports and switches and whatnot. On other units that we've looked at with a large base like this, there's usually a voltage selector switch somewhere usually on the back here. Uh, and I don't see one here. So I don't know if this is an auto sensing power supply, but that brings me to my next point where we're gonna have to make sure that we read this manual. So before I kind of go over the rest of the parts here, we'll talk about them as we come to them for the assembly. We've got a bag of bits and some other pieces that are gonna get bolted onto here. I'm gonna spend a couple minutes and do exactly that, read the manual, and then we'll come back. All right, so I read the manual. There is no mention of a voltage selector switch, but it does say that it's good for 110 to 240 volts, uh, which means that it's probably auto sensing, so we shouldn't have to worry about clicking the switch across. And I did also look under the unit and I don't see any switch anywhere, so I'm gonna assume that's okay. We're lucky here that even if it wasn't the wrong voltage, we're not gonna blow anything because we're only 110. Uh, if you were in Europe or somewhere where there's 220 or 240, um, you would have a bad experience if it was set to 110 on your power supply. Um, the instruction manual starts off by talking about affixing some of these drag chains uh, with some M3 screws, um, doing that on the upright. But that's kind of difficult when I don't have some way to hold the upright for me. So I'm actually going to skip that step and come back. We're just gonna attach this to the base here. And to do so, we're gonna grab the bag with the long bolts. These are M5 by 45, and there's four of them with little lock washers on them. 
hopefully you can see that there. Uh, and so there's little grooves milled out of the base here um, where this is going to sit in those grooves. And then very carefully, I'm going to bolt up and underneath uh, into the bottom of these uprights here and snug that all down, make sure it's flush with the base on either side, uh, and then we'll come back. Quick correction. So the cable that I said was for the screen over on this corner, it's not on that corner, it's on the right hand uh, front section. Um, and it's this long cable here. Um, I believe it's this long cable, but it was draped underneath the printer and poking out the other side. So it actually belongs over here with the USB ports and whatnot. The first step in the manual, uh, you know, because we skipped a few steps to assemble this, was to attach the cable chain or the drag chains here um, to the to the upright. Um, and you know, mine's completely detached here. Uh, the upright and the base were kind of tangled. The cords were tangled in the box. They are completely separate in the box, but as I was pulling them out, they kind of tugged and it popped it off. It's not a big deal. These things just clip right back on. Um, this connector here is going to go to the back of the upright here and it only goes in one direction. If yours is disconnected like this, just make sure everything's like straight and not all twisted and tangled. And then connect that in there. Should kind of click. There we go. And then I'll just reconnect the cable chain to the piece that's affixed to the upright here, like that. Okay. And then this side here should just get attached here. And then for the X axis, so that would be this one. Same kind of thing right here. We have uh, another end to the cable chain. So we'll just attach this on there. And just make sure you're not pinching any of the wires in the process. So now that I've got this side attached, this side's gonna connect up here. This is the part that gets bolted on um, because we have the end piece attached here and it's not pre-assembled on there like the rest of them were. Um, but we need to attach the cable here. So just make sure that these little fingers are open like that. And this guy only goes in one way. There's a little key or a tooth on it. That kind of makes sure you have it aligned it properly. There is some slack there, so you can pull a little bit of extra cord through. There we go. And then this piece here, these holes, bolt onto the back of the X carriage. So there are three holes right here. So that will bolt right like that. And for that, we're using M3, oops, M3 by five millimeter. So really, like I said, there's not very many bolts here. It's going to be these. So as I said, these M3 screws are going to go through here and then into the back. So now we're ready to install these upright support posts. I'm not sure what they call them, but we've seen these, I think originally on like the Wanhao D9 Mark II or something. Um, but on a gantry that is this high, especially, you can end up with a lot of wobble, right? Especially since we plan on putting the uh, filament spools up here, um, that just kind of increases that potential. Uh, I don't know if it's a legitimate problem, but there's potential there and why take any chances, right? So this allows us to assemble a rod from here to here and using these little eye screws, we can unscrew them to kind of apply pretension so that there is no slack at all. Uh, and then this is super rigid. I mean, a nice triangular structure there. So we're going to use this last bag of screws. There are two different lengths, long ones and short ones. <laughs> the long ones are going to go in the bottom. So the short ones go in the top. And the instructions say to just gently screw those in there like that. There are also two washers. I believe the washers, if you don't throw them on the floor, I believe the washers are for the bottom just to provide a little extra clearance between the post and the base. Otherwise it might uh, kind of rub, rub on the base. So. so on the bottom here, we'll take one of these washers and we're gonna place it on the inside of the little eyelet there like that. And so the washer goes against the printer and then it's going to go into this screw hole right there. Now that seems, seems excessively long, but it is what it is. Then we'll just do the same thing on this side. And when we're done this, if, uh, or as we're doing this, if we find that the rod is not the appropriate length, 
then definitely loosen the nut there to allow you to unspin or spin in this eyelet to change the length a little bit uh, until you're, you're kind of happy with the fitment. And then tighten everything down. All right, and now this will be interesting to the keener behind the camera here. We're gonna attach the screen. So we have this little bracket and it's going to attach to here. Uh, there are three of these black screws left. I think they're M4, it doesn't really matter, they're the last three left. And so there are three holes in the side of this bracket. So this is going to go like that. And we'll just kind of pre-thread these, line them up with the holes, finger tighten them, and then just tighten it all down. Okay, so we're ready to attach the screen, but first we're gonna connect the cable. Um, it only goes in one way, so just plug that in there. Now this cable does stretch to like seven feet long. I'm not quite sure why you'd need it that long, maybe. Uh, maybe there's some reason. But this little hoop here is likely to act as kind of a strain relief, so that if the cord does get pulled, it's not yanking on the, on the end of the connector there. Uh, and the cord goes towards the top, so this would be like that. And I'm just thinking from like a cabling perspective, maybe it makes sense to kind of loop the cord like that, just so it's coming out the top. Not sure. And then that should go like that. So we could have done this at any time during the build, but it's probably a good time to start connecting all these cables. Um, so we have motor cables for the dual Z here. Um, so connect those. And on the right hand side here, so facing the back of the printer on the right hand side, um, there's a second connector here. And that I believe is for the filament runout sensor up here. All right, so last thing is to hook up the spool holder. But as I moved this bed forward, I kind of realized the bed's a little sloppy. And I just mentioned how there should be no slop. We don't have to worry about V wheel tension or anything because of the linear rails. So this bed is, is rigidly attached to the undercarriage. So there are no springs or wheels or anything to tighten underneath. Luckily on the top here, it's affixed with I think nine screws and they've cut the, um, the magnet sheet out so that you can access them. So if you do have any kind of play in the bed here, uh, just make sure that each of these screws are, are good and, and tightened down uh, and then you can reinstall your, your build plate. One more thing worth mentioning is I've been manhandling this build plate during this build and now my greasy fingerprints are all over that. Before you print, make sure that you clean this off. You could use soap and, and water, like a mild soap and water, uh, isopropyl alcohol, something like that to get the grease off um, because prints are not going to stick very well where my hands have been. All right, now spool holder. We have these and this. Um, so my cameraman here was asking, well, why did they give you a spare? Uh, in this case, it's actually a double-sided spool holder. So these just kind of twist and lock into both sides like that. And then this just kind of snaps on to the top rail here. So you'll insert the back piece. Oops, kind of centered. I want to just move him. Come on. So insert the back and then rotate it forward or opposite, sorry. Insert the front, rotate it back and it kind of just locks itself in place. So just friction fit like that. And then the last cord here is for the filament runout sensor and make sure that the arrow is in the appropriate direction and connect the cord. There we go. Um, now you wanna make sure that this cord isn't touching the belt. So we do have a synced belt at the top here that just keeps both uh, Z lead screws in sync with one another so that you don't end up with an off kilter uh, X axis. Um, and we do still have dual motors. So one motor isn't kind of doing double duty at least. Um, but make sure that, yeah, make sure that this is not touching that. If you need to, you can feed some of the, um, some of the slack of the cable uh, down through the back channel and all the way down to the bottom here where we plugged it in earlier, um, just so that that doesn't become a problem in the future. Right. There we go. And the wire is kind of hidden um, with this little plastics uh, kind of cover or guard uh, all the way inside the extrusion here. Just double check, that looks good, okay. Great, um, now, you know, why would you want to have a spool on both sides? Honestly, 
don't know, um, because if you're gonna use this side, your filament runout sensors on the other side. There is a provision here, you know, there's a threaded insert where you could unbolt this and bolt it over there. Um, I don't know if I'd suggest having it run sideways and over there, but uh, it gives you that option anyway. If you're not using the runout sensor at all, then by all means, go nuts and use the second side here. Um, I tend to not use a runout sensor, especially if I'm running really abrasive filament. Um, you know, I have some carbon fiber that's eight or 10% uh, and it's basically like 80 grit sandpaper. I wouldn't run it through here personally. Um, so that might be a situation where I'll run it on this side. So after all that talk about not having V wheels, we still do on the Z axis um, and on the, on the X. So on the Z axis, they don't get much wear and tear at all. You know, you know it's not moving up and down rapidly over and over as it is in the X direction. Um, but you wanna make sure that they're properly tensioned. So on the outside, you have two wheels and those are just permanently affixed. On the inside, you have your typical offset, uh, offset nut kind of situation. So you just kind of turn him until that wheel is contacting the groove here. So, you know, it shouldn't just spin freely. It should try to actually move the axis when you jiggle the wheel. You just want there to be a decent amount of tension. There we go. And then on the X, um, the two top ones here are adjustable. The bottom ones are, are stationary. And so same thing, you just wanna make sure that everything has firm contact with the rail, which will ensure that there's no slop or wobble or anything in the hot end as it's traveling. There we go. And when you move it, move slowly. But when you move it, you shouldn't feel any kind of like any little uh, indented sections. That's an indication that either your, your wheels are damaged or that they're just simply too tight. Um, and so loosen them off if you've kind of hulked them down like that. But, so I'm gonna spend some time and do some printing. I'll go through the manual and do you know the proper auto bed leveling routine. We do have a BL Touch style contact sensor there for the bed leveling. Um, and as I mentioned, the bed doesn't have any dials to do manual leveling, so it is what it is. Um, I'll play with their software to do some Wi-Fi or hardwired uh, prints. I might dabble with the cloud printing, though it's not something I typically use, uh, but that's definitely an option as well. Uh, and then we'll come back, we'll show you the test prints we did, and we'll discuss my experience with the machine. Okay, so let's insert the USB stick into the front of the machine. And then this is the main screen that you land on when you turn on the printer. We can see the hot end temperature is at 18 degrees and it's currently set to zero. Uh, the heated bed is 17 degrees and currently set to zero. So that tells us, you know, our ambient temperature in here is somewhere between 17 and 18 degrees. We are on the print screen. If we want to warm the printer up, we could go to the temperature screen. Um, there are some automatic presets here. So for PLA and ABS, if I hit on PLA, we can see that the um, hot end is going to 200 degrees and the heated bed is going to 60, which are pretty sane temperatures for preheating for PLA. Um, I could also do manual where I can control them individually. Um, and if you hit cooling, it will turn the heat off on, on both of them, uh, on the uh, nozzle and on the heated bed. If you hit cooling, it just brings you a shortcut for that cooling menu where you can cool the entire thing down, yes or no. I'll just say no, I want it to keep heating up. If we look around the settings here, so we have leveling. So this is for the bed leveling sequence. It'll home the X, Y, and Z in the center. Uh, and then it's going to do the 25 point, so five by five grid of, uh, of probing points and build that topographical mesh of the bed. If you're using Creality's slicer, um, it automatically does a bed leveling sequence before every print. So because I've already done a auto bed leveling, it's showing me the existing topography, the values that it measured at each of the points. Um, I can hit uh, start, and now it will actually go through each of those points and probe them again. So now we see the new topography that it's measured of each of those points. Um, so we can get out of here, and that's automatically saved. There we go. Other options we have here, so refuel. So this is for reloading filament. Um, as you can see, I've already loaded some filament in here that I, that I cut. Um, if I hit refuel, um, I can choose the speed, um, how many millimeters to move, uh, and then I can retract it or feed it in. It tells me the hot end temperature there. Um, so if I was removing this, let's say, I would go high speed. I could grab this and I could go retreat. Uh, and let's go, not 10 millimeters, let's go 25. 
Should be far enough. There we go. We do it again. There. Now, normally I would not pull it out that way. I would actually press this in and just do a quick yank because um, you can end up with a bunch of this kind of stringy stuff as you pull it out slowly from the hot end. Um, that's what that menu's for. Uh, motor controls, so we could, you know, right now the motor is locked. We can disable the motors and now this spins, you know, moves freely. Um, when we move an axis, it will re-engage the motors. So if we um, home the Z, for example. In axis move, um, obviously we can home um, X and Y. We can home the Z, which also homes X and Y and then homes Z in that sequence like we just saw. Um, we can also turn off the motors from here. Um, and we can choose how much we want to move in each in each segment. So I can move 10 millimeters at a time, and I can move the Y back like that, or forward. Same thing with X, of course, and I can move the Z. Z's a little bit slower to move than X and Y, obviously. And at the bottom, it shows us our, our current coordinates. Um, so I just moved the Z 51.5 millimeters off the um, off the bed. Uh, language, so obviously we're in English, but we could choose a different language. Um, about has your firmware version, um, you know, your model and the firmware version. Um, and I believe this here is actually the screen firmware version, 1.2.2. Um, but that's the board firmware of 1.5.2. Um, under advanced settings, so we have the PLA settings. So these are the um, preheat uh, presets that we saw a moment ago for PLA. Um, same for ABS, our preheat settings. Um, you could do a temperature PID tuning. Um, so this is if you're, you know, if you're calling for 200 degrees, let's say, on the hot end, and it's going 205 and then 198 and then 203 and 199. If it's kind of fluctuating like that, um, it's a good indication that you need to do a PID tuning, which will just recalibrate to make sure that it knows how to fluctuate the voltage to keep that temperature extremely stable. Um, we could uh, restore all the settings to defaults and we can um, turn on and off the Wi-Fi here. Now I'm not currently using Wi-Fi or hardwire, I'm using the USB stick, um, but you, that's where you would do that. So Z-axis compensation, this is important. Um, so out of the box, um, this was I think minus one millimeter. So that's describing the difference in height from the probe to the nozzle itself. So when the probe hits the bed, it thinks that's zero, but the nozzle is still a little bit above the bed, right? So what is that difference? Well, the nozzle in this case is 1.5 millimeters above the bed when the probe hits the bed. Um, and to test this and calibrate this, here's what we would do. Let's home all axes. So I'll just home X, Y, and Z here. Okay. And then I'll bring the Z down to zero. And don't worry, even though I'm going 10 millimeters at a time, if I press down again, it's not gonna smash into the bed. It'll just stop at zero. There we go. So now it thinks the nozzle is at zero, so therefore on the bed. I'll go back to the Z axis compensation. We'll set this back to um, minus one, which is where it came from the factory. And taking normal printer paper, we can see that there's no drag at all between the nozzle and the, the paper. And as I bring this more negative, we were at minus 1.5, or yep. There is a decent amount of drag on the paper. There we go. Not too much. Actually, I might be able to go just a little bit more. There we go. So there should be some resistance there, and this is just standard, standard printer paper. So once I've got that set, then I go back out. If your first layer is not smooshing against the bed properly, then it's a good indication that your Z axis is, uh, your Z offset here is just off. So it needs to be a little bit more negative to bring that nozzle closer to the bed. All right, so with all that said, we are now ready to print. Let's go back to the print screen. We're still at temperature here. I'm gonna hit plus. And I've got uh, one sliced file that I made. Uh, and then the rabbit and nozzle air guide that came with the printer. So I'm going to load some Creality filament in here. 
uh, and we'll print the rabbit. So clicking on rabbit, I'll hit preview. We can see a representation of what it is. That looks good. We'll hit print and it's going to do its um, bed leveling sequence. And the printer is not happy because there's no filament in here. So let me load that filament and then I will hit uh, yes to continue and it'll go ahead and print. Okay, so we're back and here is our bunny. As I mentioned, uh, this was printed in Creality uh, white PLA. Um, I used their PLA because I assumed that their slice was done with their PLA in mind. Um, I know that they do give you that little sample spool, but I had a full size spool that I could throw up here. Um, so I used that um, and it turned out great. Um, definitely printed on the slower side, uh, probably in the 60 millimeters a second range or so. Um, and you know, a printer this size, printing something like this, might not be the best use of a printer of, of this stature. Um, but if you were printing maybe a hundred of these, you could have them all the way across the bed and do it in one fell swoop. So that's kind of cool. Um, this thing gives off a lot of heat <laughs> during that process. So, you know, I am printing a small print, 60 degree bed, uh, but there's a lot of surface area here. So it actually heated my entire office um, to the point where I left the window open. Um, so just kind of bear that in mind if you are doing a lot of, uh, a lot of long prints in a, uh, in a short or a small enclosed space, um, you're just gonna wanna make sure you have adequate ventilation for multiple reasons, but one of them being uh, the heat given off by this. Um, but it worked out great um, as one would expect, printed perfectly. Um, nothing to talk about really there. Um, the second print was a fan shroud. Um, so this fan shroud uh, looks very similar to this one here. Um, so that's a 4020 fan on there. And I just wanted to kind of show you, I haven't taken the supports off. So this is how it came out. It printed like that on the bed. And if I just kind of squish this with any luck, there we go. Most of them came off. Now they did do supports everywhere. So there are supports in the actual um, ducting channels there. Uh, so you just gotta kind of get a sharp tool in there just to kind of poke them out. But you can see it came off cleanly without much struggle at all. Um, the cooling fan is doing a great job. Um, and this, as you can see here, redirects the fan's output right to the sides of the nozzle there. So it's going right where you need it. Um, that's great and uh, kind of cool that they gave you a pre-sliced file to print a replacement part for yourself. Um, this was printed in the same PLA. Um, I would think that for myself, if I was printing myself a replacement fan shroud, I'd do it in something a little bit more temperature resistant than PLA, especially considering the proximity to the, the hot bits. Um, you know, even PETG might be better. Uh, ABS is a definite uh, obvious candidate there. Um, again, printed beautifully, nothing to be concerned about at all. And my slice. So this was my first time using Creality Slicer. Um, and all I did was loaded the software, which came on that USB stick. Um, the USB stick did have a newer version of the software than was on their website. So I would suggest maybe starting with what's on the USB stick and seeing if there's an update. Um, but the slicer, you just installed it, it chose the printer as you saw on the screencast there. Uh, it was pre-configured for the printer and it even had some profiles uh, out of the box. So this was the PLA fast profile. I made no other changes at all. Um, it was, uh, the default temperature was acceptable for this uh, gradual rainbow PLA filament that I had. Um, so I left that alone too. The only change I did make though was removing the supports because by default that profile had the supports enabled. Um, and the only way I could seem to get supports to disable is to edit the profile. I couldn't just override that one setting. Um, but once I got that sorted out, this is what came off um, and it printed like that. And as you see, it requires no supports at all. Kind of a cool organic shape to a shelf bracket of sorts. Um, but I just thought I would show you a nice smooth uh, contours, um, you know, no issues as one would expect. Super adequate cooling. I mean, some of these overhangs are extremely steep. Um, and there's very, very little, maybe one strand of droop here and there. Um, but honestly, I'm very happy with this. Uh, and like I said, no tinkering, no calibrating, assemble the machine, load the default profile, hit print, 
and you're off to the races. Um, now, this is a simple print, of course, and by design, you should start probably with some simple prints, um, and it didn't need supports. When you get into something that needed extremely complex supports, let's say I had to print this in this orientation or something, um, you know, that's, that's where uh, you're best to walk before you run. Uh, so I wouldn't suggest loading up a 20 hour print and hitting go after you've done these two first ones, because uh, there's a lot to learn in the slicer. Um, even though it does have some nice um, pre-canned profiles for various materials um, and various materials. So it wasn't just PLA profiles that it had, it had ABS and others. Um, you would just want to make sure at the very least that the temperatures kind of jive with the particular material that you're using. Um, and then there's obviously the options of going in there and playing with a lot of the advanced settings. Um, but to get started, uh, you don't need to really worry about that. And of course, it's compatible with all kinds of slicers. Um, so you could use Super Slicer or Prusa Slicer. Um, standard G-code is what it takes, so um, you have flexibility that way as well. Hopefully you found all that useful. Remember, like and subscribe and ring the bell to get notified when we upload more videos. And I hope you enjoy your CRM4.